Allah says on that day when it's my court, when it will be only me, when Allah will be the judge, when Allah will be the jury, Allah says on that day, you employ somebody and you do not pay them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. Mawlana Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man sabi'ahum bi ahsanin ila yawm al-deen wa ba'd. Brothers, elders, sisters, salam alaykum wa rahmatullah. Some brother last week sent me a clip, a link for a documentary which uh, the BBC played, which was called Made in Hell. But made like the word maids. And I watched it and subhanAllah, it was really a jeep that how people could actually treat other human beings in this manner. And a lot of it documented the plight of maids from poor countries like Africa, like the sub India subcontinent, and who had traveled to the Middle East to get a better way of life. And I, I watched this documentary in all honesty and I was thinking, how is it possible that a human being could treat another human being in this manner? And worse than that, how is it possible for a Muslim to treat another human being in this manner? And, wallahi, and, 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 I, and I got shocked. Because when you look at the teachings of the deen, they are so far away. The teachings of how to deal with one's employees are so removed from this. See, in this dunya, you generally have those you know, who are the haves and those who are the have-nots. Those who are well-to-do and those who are not so well-to-do. Those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, in this short period, in this short life, He gives them so He can test them. What will they do with that wealth? What will that wealth do to them? And then he, there's those who are the have-nots. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, often they, have, they don't have much. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts them in this state. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see how they will deal with their trials and tribulations. So for the rich and the poor, they are trials and tribulations. But when I watched this documentary, you know what really struck me was that these were people who were leaving their homes to go thousands of miles away, leaving their children, leaving their husbands, leaving their mother, their fathers. Why? To get a better life for their children. Now, the scope of this talk is not the rights and wrongs of them leaving their children. Because I, I, one of the brothers said, Oh, but Sheikh, how could they leave without a mahram? Some were Muslims, some were non-Muslims. How could they leave with a mahram, without a mahram? I said, listen, we are not in their shoes to judge what kind of poverty those people were going through. And let me bring it home. Our parents made that journey once upon a time. So you and I, in their minds, could have a better life. So we are the last people who should be judging other people who want a better life for themselves and for their children. And when I look into the life of the Prophet wasallam on this issue, the message of Allah wasallam even before Nabuwa, even before he became a Nabi, was a man who cared for those who nobody else cared for. When the first revelation descended, the Prophet sallallahu hurried to his wife and he said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, cover me, cover me. And she asked him what happened. And he told her. And then he said, Khashitu ala nafsi, I fear for my life. What did she say? This is, she's depicting our messenger sallallahu before prophethood. 
She said, Kalla wallahi la yufzik Allah abda. Inna ka la tasil rahim, wa tahmil kalla, wa taksibul ma'doom, wa tu'inu ala nawaib al-haq. She said, by Allah, Allah will never forsake a man like you. You're the one who reconciles ties. Tahmilul kalla means you carry people's burdens. You take that burden from their shoulders and you place it on your shoulders. Wa taksibul ma'doom. Ma'doom comes from the word Adam, which means nobodies in societies. Those people who are nobody in society, you are the one who cares and works and earns for those people. Those who nobody wants to look at society, you are the one who cares. And you are the one who always there to stand up for the truth and help other people. This was the Prophet Sallallahu before Nabuwa. Before prophethood, can you imagine how, you know, how great these sifat and these qualities became when he became a, a Nabi? And this is why, you know, this issue about how you deal with your workers and how you deal with those underneath you. Wallahi, you know, there are so many narrations out there. How can a Muslim ill-treat another human being and believe in the akhirah and believe in the day of judgment and think he can get away with it for in this short dunya. If you look into the Quran, there's a beautiful example of how a man treated another man as an employee. And that's the story of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam leaves, runs away from Fir'aun and he comes to a certain area and he sees a group of people around a well and they have their flock there and they're watering and they're giving the uh, sheep and their flock water. And then he sees two girls waiting. And these girls are waiting their turn and they need all the men to finish. So he approaches them and he asks them, why are you not giving water to your flock? And they say, look, our fathers are old men and old man. And these are all men standing here and we can't go any further. We need them to finish and then we can... You know, we're not strong enough to compete with the men. So what he does is that he does the honorable thing. He takes out water and he gives it to their flock. So these girls go home and they tell their father. Who was their father? Their father was Shoaib alayhi salatu salam. A Nabi as well. So he sends one of his daughters back and his daughters come to Musa alayhi salatu salam. And she says to Musa, my father want, is calling you because he wants to repay you. He wants to pay you for that little good deed that you did. So he goes to now Shoaib alayhi salatu salam. And he tells Shoaib alayhi salatu salam his story. And Shoaib alayhi salatu salam said, don't worry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved you from this evil qawm. And then he says to him, he says, listen, I will give you a home. I will give you payment. I will even marry one of my two daughters to you. And I want you to do one of two things. Either work for me eight years, I need your help. Stay with me for eight years or ten years, but you choose. And then he says, Ma uridu ana shukka alayk. He said, but I don't want to overburden you. Whatever is easy for you. And then he says, Satajiduni insha'Allah min as salihin and you, do, you will see that when I deal with you as an employer and you as an employee, you will see that I will be from the pious. I will never ever transgress any of your rights. Even Allah does not burden a soul passes a bill. Allah does not burden a soul passes ability. And you have subhanAllah. Today, people who treat other human beings like they are animals. The teachings of the deen, wallahi, are so removed. When Abu Dhar called Bilal, he insulted him through his mother. The Prophet ﷺ called him. Bilal was a Muslim, but he used to be a slave. He called him and he said, did you actually say that to Bilal? And then he said, you are a man of ignorance. Then the rest of the narration. Let me tell you the rest of the narration. Then the Prophet ﷺ moved towards slaves. 
He said, Bilal is a Muslim. He's free. He said, let me tell you about slaves. He says, Ikhwanakum hawlukum. He says, your brothers are those who are underneath you, those slaves. In the Arabic language, generally you would say, Khawlukum ikhwanukum. Those slaves of yours are your brothers. But the Prophet ﷺ brought brothers before the slaves. Because he's saying that the greatest relationship that you have with those slaves are that they are your brothers. Your brotherhood overrides everything else. Then he said to him, you spoke like that to Bilal, let me tell you how I expect you to treat other slaves. He said, you feed them the same food that you eat. You give them the same clothing as the clothes that you wear. And then he says, never overburden your slaves. And if you give them a difficult duty, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, then you assist them on that duty. You assist them on that duty. Look at, this is the teaching of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it was regarding to slaves. And this is why they say, in many parts of the world today, what they have today is modern day slavery. They leave their homes. And there was a lady who left her home, a Sri Lankan lady, went to Saudi Arabia. 17 years. 17 years she lived in Saudi, never got paid a penny, was kept in a, as a slave for years. She never even spoke to her family. 17 years, that's a life sentence. That's what you get for murder. Muslims do that to other human beings. Every year, Every year, 10,000 maids run away from Saudi Arabia. Just from Bangladesh, a thousand run away every single year from Saudi Arabia because of the way they're abused, beaten. And this doesn't mean, look, this doesn't mean that all, all the Middle East is like this. The vast majority of mashallah are very good. The vast majority obviously treat them well. That's why there are so many people there. But there are some people, you can't even believe that these people are actually human beings. They get raped, beaten, psychological torture, physical torture. At times, there's stories, there's so many stories that, that they actually even get burnt. They throw petrol, not, not just scorched by irons and cigarettes. They, th they throw petrol over them. I just reading the other day, just last few weeks ago, where a lady from Bangladesh, she came back. She said, I could feel them pouring the petrol on my back. How could you do that? Now, how, how, how is that humanly possible that you could do that to another human being? This is what, listen, this is what Abu Jahl did to Bilal. This is what, Umayya bin Khalf did to Bilal. This is what Abu Jahal did to Zunaira. That's the things that they did. And, and it's, uh, wallahi, it's unbelievable that today that you have people who can still do the same things. You have, you know, in Kuwait, some, some Arab countries have tried to, you know, improve the situation. Kuwait, they decided to give their workers, their maids, one day off in a week. There was an outcry. One day in a week, and this is not where you work and you go home, you live in the same place often. One day, oh, Qatar, the football, the stadiums, how many people die, how many workers die every single year because of you know, the situation? No health and safety. And, and this, 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 how far this is from, you know, the, the teachings of a deen. In the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, there was a person, he burnt his slave girl. Umar brought the man to him, he said, I swear by Allah, if it wasn't for the fact that Allah made it haram to burn other people, I would have burnt you like you burnt her. This was his slave girl. In the time of the Prophet look how the Messenger of Allah dealt with people. 
There was a person, a Jewish young boy, who used to just do the khidmah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Only do the khidmah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard that he was ill. And the father of this young boy was a man who used to put thorns in the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when the Messenger of Allah would go out to relieve himself, he would hope that one of these thorns would prick the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Messenger of Allah heard that this young Jewish boy is ill. What did he used to do? He used to do the khidmah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ran to his house. He knocked on the door. His father, when he opened his door, he saw the man, you know, his greatest agitator, his greatest enemy. But his heart melted when he told him that I've come to see your son. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sat by, the, sat by the bed of this young boy. And he said to this young boy, he said, Bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I will intercede for you on the day of judgment. And this boy said, this boy began to look at his father. And his father, whose life mission, it was to harm the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he saw the concern of the message of Allah, his heart melted. And he said, Ati Abu Qasim. He said, whatever Abu Qasim tells you, do it. And he recited the Shahada. And the Prophet ﷺ left. And he was elated. Because shortly after this, the boy passed away. And the Prophet ﷺ was elated. And he le left the room and he was slapping his thigh. And he said, all oh, praise be to Allah who made me a source of removing one person from eternal doom into eternal success. This was a young boy who did the khidmah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look how the Messenger of Allah treated this young boy. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu was 10 years old when he came into the khidmah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, for nine years I stayed in the khidmah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, never once did he say, oof to me. Never once did he say, oh Anas, why did you not do that? Or why did you do that? Nine years. He said, one day the Messenger of Allah told me to do, go on a chore. He said, I went out and I got busy playing with children because he was young. He said, the Prophet Sallallahu came behind me and, and, and he touched my shoulders. And he said, I looked around and the Messenger of Allah was smiling. And he said, ya Onais, Onais is oh small Anas. And they use this in affection in Arabic. Oh, Anais, he said, go and do what I told you to do. Now, this is how the message of Allah, this is the teachings of our deen. And you look at what we see in the world today. And let, let me make this clear. It's not exclusive to the Middle East. The same happens in Pakistan. The same happens in Bangladesh. The same happens in Africa. It's only because in the Middle East, people go into that country from the outside. And that's why it's recorded to the degree it's recorded. But it happens. Let me tell you, let me go a step further. It happens in many homes around us today. You're trying to tell me you don't have slave labor? The way many who treat their daughter-in-laws? Many who treat their son-in-laws? Because somebody happened to come from a different foreign country. And now you got him locked down, slave labor. And then you, will, then you will say you're Muslims. And then you will quote these things. 18 hours people work in these countries. Locked down. Lebanon. Let me tell you about Lebanon. Lebanon is regarded as one of the more liberal Arab countries, Middle Eastern countries. 67% of the domestic workers died by committing suicide in Lebanon. Do you believe that? 67% of the domestic maids who come from other countries, vast majority Africa, poor countries, you know, who have nothing, who try, who, who, leave, who leave their children. In, in this documentary, Made in Hell, there was a woman from Africa, from Kenya, she left her four children, her husband. They lived in a shack. And she went there for a year. And, and then she got burnt. And she, she, she was still alive when she got back to Kenya. And she said, when, when I was burnt, I called for the madam. And all I could hear, somebody, all I could feel was somebody kicking me. 
somebody kicking me. And then they told, and then her husband telling the story. He's a Christian, she's a Christian. And he's saying that I got a phone call. 41 days she stayed in hospital. They didn't tell the family. Right before the day she was about to be sent home, 100% burns on her hands, 47% burns on her body. And, and the husband who's a Christian, he's telling the story. He said, the lady rang me and she said, your wife is all right. She's walking, she's talking, she's coming tomorrow. Inshallah. Inshallah. That's what really hit me. Because the vast majority of these countries are Muslim. He said, Inshallah. Your wife, your wife is coming tomorrow. She reached and he saw his wife. She lived a little while and she passed away. Now this, this is the state of the Muslims. This is how you... And she wasn't paid a penny. All the time that she lived, she wasn't paid a penny. You should see the state of the guy's house. He lives in, he lives in a mud... Really, it's worse than a mud hut. And you look at the teaching, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A, a certain person's camel bolted away. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what's wrong with your camel? He said, message of Allah, the camel's bolted away. And it's, and it's attacking people. And the message of Allah said, let me go. And they said, oh no, message of Allah is too dangerous. Don't go. It'll attack you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, where is it? I said, it's in that garden. So the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went into the garden. He entered into the garden. And the camel saw him and the camel walked up to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the narrator says, it placed its head on the shoulder of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then I saw a tear flow from the camel's eye. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, who is the owner of this camel? They said, there's a young Ansari kid. So call him. He said, your camel is complaining that you overwork it and you don't feed it enough. The message of Allah, this deen gave animals their rights. It gave animals their rights. There was a man who had a camel and he would, mystery, he would make this camel work very hard until it became old and it could no longer work. And they told the message, and then he intended to slaughter it. And they told the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called this young, uh, called this man, and look at the words the message of Allah was. He was infuriated. It was a camel. He should make it work hard. It became old. Now he wanted to slaughter it, and the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam called him, and he said, "Akalta shababahu, ida ajiza." He said, shabab. Look at the word. He said, you ate its youth. And when now it no longer has the ability and capacity to work, you want to slaughter it? This, this was an animal. And the message of Allah said, you abused it when it had the power. Now it no longer has the power. You don't want to sustain it. You don't want to support it. You want to slaughter it? The narration mentioned it had an impact on the man and he decided not to, not to slaughter it. So brothers, let me ask you a question. Wallahi, th th this, this, these teachings in our deen have been there for 1400 years. What makes, and I want to bring this home now, what makes a person, what makes a person abuse other people? There are generally, they say, two reasons. Because people like to be dominant. And evil people will take their dominance out on other individuals. Because it makes them feel powerful. And the second thing is that they like to humiliate the nature of people who abuse. See, a person will not abuse an animal generally as to the degree he will abuse another human being. You know why? Because you cannot humiliate another an animal to this way you can humiliate another human being. And every abuser, every single abuser in history, may it be, may it be the leaders, may it be a husband, may it be an employer, everyone justifies it. You know how they justify it? Because they dehumanize the other person. And they justify it because now that person deserves it. And that's the only way it happens. And let me tell you, let me finish off here. If you have anybody working for you, 
Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He said, pay that person before the sweat dries up from their forehead. Pray that person before the sweat dries up from their forehead. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I have the greatest right over the believers. Fit dunya wal akhirah. Meaning that in this dunya, I am their wali. And the akhirah, I will be their wali. You abuse any believer or you abuse anybody, anybody in this dunya. On the day of judgment, you will have to stand in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But let me tell you another narration related by Bukhari. It's a hadith a Qudsi. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, He says, Thalathatun. أَنَا خَصْمَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He said, three people, I, Allah says, imagine this, it's Allah's court, the day of judgment, when Allah says, لِمَنَ الْمُلْكَ الْيَوْمِ On that day, when Allah will say, who does kingdom belong today? And nobody will speak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, three people, I will be their representative against their oppressors on that day. Firstly, that person who employs somebody and then they do the job and he does not pay them. Allah says on that day when it's my court, when it will be only me, when Allah will be the judge, when Allah will be the jury, Allah says on that day you employ somebody and you do not pay them, then you're dealing with me. You think these things are light? Can you imagine? This is a person who employs somebody and doesn't pay them. What about the atrocities we find in our Muslim countries? What will that be on the day of judgment? 18 hours you make them work? You make them sleep on the floor? You don't pay them for months? Maybe in the vast majority of the Muslim countries. And therefore brothers... Even if it's in your home, it's if back home, let me tell you, you get away with it in this dunya. But there'll be a day, wallahi, you and I will not be able to run. And therefore, fulfill people's rights in this dunya before it's too late. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who fulfill the rights of others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the suffering of those who are poor. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate their status because the people who are poor on the day of judgment will go 500 years into Jannah before those who are rich. On that day, when each day will be equivalent to hundreds of years of this dunya, they will go into Jannah before us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Keep us united in this dunya and reunite us in Jannah for those other.